Hello, I'm Allison Thorpe, and this is God Talk, recorded and produced in the bluegrass state of Kentucky, the home of horses, hills, hiking, hillbillies, big trucks, wildcat basketball, and Daniel Boone, the state where guns are honored and shoes are optional. This is the show where science, faith, and culture are discussed openly. Welcome to God Talk, a show where a rocket scientist and a medical doctor who is also my pastor talk about science and religion. I'm your host, Doug Thorpe, and with me is always my co-host, Dr. Andy White. Today on God Talk, we have our special guest, Mr. Kenneth Samples, who is from Reasons to Believe, and he's going to talk about his book, The Seven Truths. So let's get started with Dr. Andy. Welcome to the show. Doug, today we have a very special uh, guest who's really a hero of mine, uh, Kenneth Samples. He's from the uh, religious think tank, uh, Reasons to Believe, and he's a prolific author, philosopher, theologian, and apologist. And I'm really excited to have him today. He's going to talk about his book, The Seven Truths That Changed the World, which is really going to talk about the impact of the historic Christian faith uh, on the world. He's also going to talk about St. Augustine and his impact on the early Christian faith, and we're going to hit him with some, uh, just some apologetic questions. Sounds so. like a great show. So first, this is God Talk, where we rightly divide the line between science and faith. And this is God Talk, where we faithfully examine science and reasonably examine faith. Let's go ahead and get uh, Ken on the line now. All righty. Okay, so Doug, today we have philosopher and theologian Kenneth Samples. Um, Kenneth has a great passion to help people understand the reasonableness and the relevance of the Christian truth claims. He's a senior scholar, research scholar at Reasons to Believe, and he's authored several books, uh, Christian Endgame, Seven Truths That Changed the World, which we're going to talk about today primarily. And of course, as I've mentioned before, uh, he's a big hero of mine, and I've listened to reason, Reasons to Believe a lot, and um, it's real. Uh, this is really a highlight for me to have him on the show. <laughs> yeah, you know. yeah. As you, as you mentioned to me, he's uh, <laughs> actually one of your heroes. You've listened to him so much. Okay, really let's is. get him on the air then. All right. So, Kenneth, are you on the line? I am. It's good to be with you guys. Thanks for having me on. All right. All and right. you're Fantastic. in Los Angeles, right? Or outside of L.A.? Yeah, just, just, just outside of Los Angeles, yes. All right. First of all, we just want you to tell our audience uh, a little bit about your educational background, in case they're not familiar with you, and explain how you got interested in Christian apologetics and philosophy. Yeah, very good. Um, I did my undergraduate degree at Concordia University uh, here in Southern California. It's a, a Lutheran liberal arts uh, university, uh, took a degree in history, I had an undergraduate degree as well in philosophy, and then went to uh, Biola University. Uh, Biola has a graduate theology program there called Talbot School of Theology, and I did my master's degree there in systematic theology. I became very interested in apologetics, I think largely because after I became a Christian when I was, uh, I guess, about a sophomore in college, I began talking to people about my faith. Uh, I had lots of discussion, for example, with Jehovah's Witnesses who would knock on my door, and I began talking to people who held different religious viewpoints. And, of course, studying philosophy, there was a lot of discussion and debate about the existence of God, about whether Christianity could be true, and so... Almost immediately, I, I thought apologetics was a pretty important field, and uh, I, after a few years, I worked with Walter Martin, who was the original Bible Answer Man at the mm -hmm. Christian Research Institute, and Martin had a big influence on me. And then later, um, of course, I met um, Hugh Ross and uh, went to work for Dr. Ross, and I'm I'm the non-scientist on the scholar team, so I kind of bring in the theology and the philosophy and try to keep those scientists on the straight and narrow there. <laughs> oh, that sounds familiar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, Doug. Um, tell us a little bit, and is, I guess it's okay if we call you Ken. 
Is that a, is that okay? Sure. Okay. Can, yeah. If you could just tell the audience about uh, reasons to believe what what the organization is about, and sort of I know it's a Christian think tank, and but uh, tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, very good. It, uh, Reasons to Believe is a Christian apologetics organization. It, it uh, focuses primarily on the area of uh, science and faith. So we have a number of uh, Ph.D. scientists uh, on our scholar team. Dr. Ross is the founder of the organization, a physicist, and has authored many books, uh, has become, I think, probably the leading voice in the area of kind of an old earth, uh, progressive creationist position. Uh, the organization, I think, next year will celebrate its 30th year. So RTB deals all, all, mostly with science and faith, but they let me kind of address other areas that sometimes come to bear. And uh, I've been there uh, about 18 and a half years, and uh, we have a, a staff of about 30 people there are uh, four full-time uh, uh, apologists on the scholar team, counting Dr. Ross. And so uh, we do lots of speaking, uh, sometimes debating, lots mm-hmm. of book writing. And uh, I think RTB has a, a very important message today, especially when people want to know whether the science and the Bible can go together. Absolutely. He's, that's why he's a perfect guest for us. Oh, yeah. Show. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what we... What our show's all about. That's right. Um, something I've wanted to ask you, kind of a burning question for me, as a professional apologist for the historic Christian faith, give our audience really your strongest evidential proof for God's existence. I, I know you like a cumulative case, as I do, but uh, if you just had, if somebody asked you, what what's the, the best argument you can give me that just seems very compelling to you that makes you know that there is a God? Yeah, I think that there are a lot of arguments that are that are substantive that uh, have persuasive power. I I think that a very powerful way of reasoning is is what we call in logic abductive reasoning, okay. and uh, that's using kind of an, an explanatory an inference to the best explanation. And I like to say that I think the most meaningful realities of life, so the cosmos, um, ethics. Uh, abstract entities, logic, science, and uh, even our own religious nature itself, I think all of these things point to God. That is the best explanation for why the universe is here, why it's designed, why human beings are the way they are, that they're this kind of enigmatic element of uh, greatness and wretchedness, as Blaise Pascal used to describe. (laughs) And then, of course, all the things about Jesus. So I would say that I think a cumulative case points very powerful uh, to the God of the Bible and to Christianity being uh, true and uh, reasonable and and uh, a good thing for the world. That's great. One of the reasons I love your abductive uh, ar- uh, reasoning argument is, as a physician, I use abductive reasoning all the time, uh, and I didn't yeah, really know sure. I was doing it <laughs> until I got into this. Abductive reasoning. Abductive reasoning, as he, as he described, making a cumulative case. In other words, he looks at all the different data pieces, and he puts those together and says, looking at all these pieces of evidence, they point towards the best explanation being a god rather than there not being a god. So is yeah. this the same thing as searchers? circumstantial evidence in a court case where you don't have absolutely you know physical yeah. proof but you've got enough evidence that's that says that you know the guy's either guilty or innocent yeah yeah i think that's another example of using logic i use it like i'm saying uh, i look at diagnostic uh, you know lab tests x-ray results symptoms and put those all together and say you know because i don't know for sure i don't have a test that says you have this disease but looking at the whole picture it, it looks very consistent with heart failure or whatever well, that same sounds, kind of thing yeah and that the way you're proving god you can't yes. actually prove you know without a shadow of a doubt that hey here's the guy that's but, right but you can use from all the circumstantial evidence that yes. yeah, there that there is a god okay yeah the, yeah Does that makes sense to you ken yeah, absolutely. Doctors, uh, as you know well, um, you know, they look at symptoms and they 
uh, attempt to draw the the best explanation. You know, they they come up with they're engaging in diagnostic thinking, and and historians do that, lawyers do that. I, my father was a car mechanic, and he would do that. He'd listen to the engine, and uh, as as a doctor would maybe listen to the heart mm-hmm. and draw a conclusion. And so, it is a a bit more of a modest. We're not arguing for a knockdown case closed case but we're saying what is the best way of explaining all of the meaningful realities of life and so i find that to be a very difficult argument for people to to counter absolutely well, well we've been talking uh, in the past ken we've talked about astrophysicists who are pointing to the the Big Bang and says, when we say the Big Bang is a proof of God, because where in the world did the universe come from other than God from nothing? And right. they would point, look at the same evidence as, oh no, there was something before that. It just bounced. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I I, I think that uh, I think what's powerful about all of you know this kind of abductive type of reasoning is we do look at the universe and. You know, we ask questions. It, it appears as if the universe had a singular beginning from nothing. Now, you can propose maybe a multiverse, but still there are, there are still abductive questions like, where did that come from, and how do we best explain uh, something like that? And so what I like about this type of reasoning is you are really like a doctor, and you are looking at symptoms, you're looking at the, the history of the patient, and you're saying, you know what, this makes sense. Um, and I, I think that's a, that's a powerful way. And scientists do it, too. They engage in abductive reasoning when they're developing their first hypothesis. And so uh, it, it is a form of reasoning that uh, makes sense of the world and makes sense of our particular lives. Absolutely. Something I want to ask you, because I've listened to you a lot, for you, Ken, um, with this kind of reasoning, and, and you've come to uh, historic Christian faith through it, yet there are still doubts out there. You know, occasionally I have days where I, I think, am I going? Am I wrong? Do I, have I got this wrong? Did I did I see it wrong? Um, I don't let them overtake me, and I know you don't either. But I'm curious: is there anything that keeps you up at night once in a while, or you have a doubt that just, wow, I wish I had an answer for this? How would you respond to that? Yeah, I, I think it's important to talk about doubt. I think, first of all, that anybody who thinks deeply is going to have doubts. Mm. And so I think we should tell people that uh, being a thoughtful, reflective person is going to include having limited knowledge and boundaries. And so part part of, I think, of the, the, the problem of doubt is that we're finite creatures, and we are dealing with a God that is beyond us, that is transcendent, that is infinite. And so I think as as finite creatures, uh, we have limited knowledge about the nature of reality in the world. I also think that, uh, I also think sometimes, as as I think you indicated, doubts can become corrosive, Mm -hmm. and I think it's important to kind of address them. And, you know, doubts can come... They can come from the intellect. Maybe a person just doesn't feel like they have enough knowledge to affirm God or Christ. But I think a lot of times doubts come emotionally. We have uh, we have trust problems. We have we have sin problems, and uh, sometimes there's a there's a whole mix and stew of things in the human heart. And so um, I think it's awfully important to kind of identify the kind of doubts we have, and then to try to address them. But again, I think it's important that people realize the more you think and the more you reason and and the more you reflect, uh, doubt is always going to be part of that uh, system. But uh, faith also is a very powerful thing that can Mm -hmm. overcome those kind of crushing or coercive doubts. All right, let me back up a little bit. When you said uh, your strongest evidence for God was... uh, Cumulative, cumulative cumulative argument yeah so the does abductive, that, the abductive argument does that mean if one of those examples is is uh, taken down then your whole reasoning for god is taken down or does does everything does all the pyramids have to fall before you go because you know i you know my 
I'm looking at my reasons for God, you know, proof of God, is things that happened way before, you know, way before man, such as, you know, clothing. Where, you know, why do, do humans wear clothing? Why do humans bury their dead? You know, there's no, there's no reasoning for it, as well as, you know, the Big Bang, you know, the scientific reasons, you know, things that happened way before well, man. Well, and the origin of life. We've and talked the origin about of life, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think so. I'd like him to answer it, but I don't think one of those coming out takes out the whole proof because of the way the reasoning comes yeah, together. Yeah, what we do you, what, we yeah. talked about beauty being a Right, beauty, for, yeah. There's so many. What do you think, Ken? Yes. I, I mean, typically when we talk about abductive reasoning, we don't talk about certainty, and we don't talk so much about probability as we talk about plausibility. What's, what is the most plausible explanation? Um I certainly think that, um, you know, you can look at a range of issues. You can look at the cosmos, its origin, its fine-tuning. You can look at the origin of human life, the origin of human consciousness. Mm-hmm. You can look at why are human beings ethical, why do we care about value and beauty. Uh, and then, of course, a whole host of issues coming out of the New Testament, the life of Jesus, its resurrection, etc., Certainly some of those arguments are more central to the truth of Christianity than others, the resurrection, for example. But I don't think kind of critiquing one of those or a couple of those is going to overtake the whole system. Rather, it's saying, look, if, if, if the Christian worldview doesn't have the most plausible explanation, then what worldview does? What, what is your best explanation for That's these types point. of issues? Yeah. So it is more moderate. There, it's not a knockdown type of argument. But again, I think it's a powerful way of thinking about Christianity, that Christianity makes sense of the things that are most meaningful and most intelligible in the world in which we live. Yeah, I think so, and that's a good way to put it. Moving next on to your book, that's a good transition, because one thing about the Christian worldview is that uh, Jesus Christ was resurrected, and of course, if somebody were to dig up his body and prove that he wasn't resurrected, that would blow that one. But, uh, you know, it wouldn't say there wasn't a God, but it would certainly say that uh, the resurrection wasn't as it says, you know. But moving into that, uh, looking at that, uh, your book, Seven Truths, makes claims about the world that say the world has been impacted in a major way uh, maybe in a revolutionary way by the Christian faith, and so I'd like for you to talk a little bit about you know why you wrote that book, and then we have several questions about those truths. Yeah, uh, I, the subtitle of my book has to do with uh, what we call dangerous ideas, discovering Christianity's most dangerous ideas, and I I chose that as a provocative title, a, a dangerous idea in philosophy or in science is an idea that turns the apple cart upside down. It challenges Hmm. the paradigm of the day. So Darwin's idea was a dangerous idea. Uh, Albert Einstein's idea of relativity was a dangerous idea. It changed the way people look at the nature of reality. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't think of a more paradigm-challenging issue than the idea that there was one man who died but didn't stay dead. <laughs> I mean, right. as, a, as, a, as a physician, you know very well that uh, biological systems break down. We, mm. we all know that our, our grandparents, our parents die. Uh, we see children die. And, and by the way, I would say probably the nagging issue I have sometimes is when I see children suffer. Mm-hmm. That is, I have an answer for it, but I have an ache in my heart when I see small children, maybe with cancer. It, it, yeah. I know the compassion. I, I'd move heaven and earth to change that circumstance. So that's, that's kind of an aching element. But, you know, you look at the resurrection. I mean, if, if Jesus Christ rose from the dead, and there's good uh, historical evidence that he did, um, everybody needs to know about that. It is such a radical idea, it's such a dangerous idea, because, I mean, for those of us who are, are reflective, we know we're going to die, we know it's going to be soon, and if atheism is true, we're going to die alone and we're going to be dead forever. Hmm. But if Christianity is true, all of that paradigm is changed. There was a man who conquered death. 
So I try to look at the book, and I, I look at various doctrinal uh, and Christian teachings that I think are dangerous ideas, meaning that they challenge the status quo, they turn everything upside down. Uh, an, another example I use in the book is that we're saved by grace. All of the world's religions teach that you are saved by being good. Yes. This idea that you're actually saved by God's grace, you're, you're saved by trusting in God, it's so counter, I mean, to the man on the street. They think, well, I'm not as good as Mother Teresa, but I'm not as bad as Saddam Hussein, so God's going to maybe give me a curve, you know, he's going he's to grade <laughs> on a curve. The idea that you're saved by grace is a is a dangerous idea, and even much of Christendom has a hard time retaining that. So I thought that this was a uh, a powerful way of talking about the central truths of the faith and showing them that Christianity is not only true, it's good. And I and I have to say, in the thirty years, thirty five years I've been involved in apologetics. I think that's how questions at the university have changed. When I was a young man, they were always asking, is Christianity true? But when I go on the university today, they want to know, is Christianity good? Hmm. What about slavery? Hmm. What, what about the Crusades? You know, does Christianity really give the kind of answers that you need? So I tried to write a book that would argue that Christianity is true, but it's also good for the world and good for individual human beings. Well, this so you mentioned about uh, young kids having cancer, and that happens to be our very first show was, why do bad things happen to good people? And we try to answer wow. that very same question. So, and it, Not that question, but it, it, that same topic. Problem of evil. Yeah. 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 Why, do, yeah. why do yeah. bad things happen to good people? And, and, you know, the logical problem of evil doesn't go through, but as we talked about the... Uh, you know the the argument that evil does exist that doesn't mean god can't exist but he may have a reason for it and and you know we went through that right. yeah, yeah but it doesn't you know and right. so uh, yeah so there is an answer for it but it still it still causes a lot of people heartburn about oh, yeah. there being a good god and that that brings me to the next question is uh christian faith is like you just talked about it's good i have a question here about how is it impacted the ethical system or ethics in the world since Christ came and died. How does that, how do you see that affecting the goodness or the ethics of the day? Yeah, that's excellent. Um, you know, the reality is if you look back at the ancient world, if you look back at the Roman empire, there was no safety net. Um, you know, most people were slaves. Hmm. They had no rights. Um, uh, the, the system was really kind of uh, against people having dignity and value. And Christianity comes along and says, no, people, all people need in the image of God, not, not just the elite, not just the mm. upper class, mm. but all people are made in the image of God. And the slaves and people who have no power, they have inherent dignity and moral worth. And I think you, what's, what's very powerful, guys, is the idea of hospice, the idea that you would care for dying people, hmm. that was a Christian idea. We can't cure them, but we can care for them, and they have dignity, and we want to treat them as as uh, God's creatures made in His image. Um, I think Christianity has influenced medicine. I think it's influenced education. It's influenced our ideas of morality that, uh, you know, People have dignity, and they have dignity when they're in the womb. They have the they have dignity at the end of their life, uh, and people need to be treated with with care. And so, you see that in the laws as they develop through Western civilization. Christianity has had uh, really uh, an incalculable influence on the way that we think about things, and even a lot of non Christians think Christianly in their values and in their beliefs, but they're not themselves Christian. They don't they don't even realize how much their culture and civilization has been influenced by Christianity. That's right. And I think a lot of times the world, the atheistic or agnostic world, uh, hijacks the goodness of Christianity. I mean they use it or they you know they don't realize they're using it. But I think it's important to emphasize the point he's making here is that 
the goodness in the world, you know, things like the fact that we don't think abortion is okay, um, that which is not okay to kill people because people are made in the image of God, that is rooted in the Christian faith. Well, think about all the Christian charities out there. That's a good point. How big they are. You know, how, yeah. how many, the, yeah. the, there's literally thousands of, of Christian charities. How many atheist charities are there out there? Well, or Islamic. Look at other or, religions. Or even Islam. Yeah. When, when there's a tragedy, you see so many Christian missions there, you don't see a lot of Islamic uh, missions to these, you know, when there's a tragedy. Yeah. That, that, that might bring up this question. For our listeners, to contrast for us in your words, you know, what is the difference between the Christian faith and, you know, Hinduism or Islam in a, in a broad sense? I mean, for the pe- person out there that doesn't know, you know, how do you break it down? What's the big difference? Yeah, that's uh, that's a, a critical question. Um, Islam is a religion that comes out of the Middle East, and they believe there is a single God, and they call him Allah. But this God is not a savior. Mm-hmm. This God is is the judge of humanity. And so Muhammad's message, which which uh, he recited, and it became the Quran. Uh, this is a message that you are to pray five times a day, and you are. To, to follow the moral principles, and God's going to put all of your works on a scale, and He's going to judge you. Uh, well, I'll tell you, um, I think the longer you live, the more you realize that the human heart is is uh, fallen, that human beings are sinful. You know, we sin in our, in our actions, but also in our thoughts, and our mm. words, and our deeds. Uh, there, there's there's no redemption in Islam. It is not a grace-oriented religion. And if you look at Hinduism, Hinduism has a variety. It's really kind of a group of religions in one. You can be a pantheist, uh, or a lot of Hindus actually believe in, they worship one god, Krishna, but you always have this karma idea that there's this principle of justice out there, and mm-hmm. and uh you suffer things in this life because of what you've done in your previous life. Well, again, that's not a grace-oriented, redemptive idea of salvation. And so I would say the fundamental difference between Islam and Hinduism, for example, and Christianity, on the other hand, is the love of God, that God became man in order to die on a cross and take away human sin. Uh, also, the Trinity allows for God to be a loving community of persons. I mean, who does Allah love in eternity right. before he created the world? He's alone. Mm. So I think the redemptive, I think uh, really all of those elements that center around the uniqueness of the person of Christ are what make Christianity so different than its religious competitors. Well, let me ask a question. On this show, we said that Christianity was a continuation of Judaism. A fulfillment of Judaism. A fulfillment of Judaism, yes. uh, which, which means that Christianity is the oldest religion, not Hinduism, because Hindu came in in 300 B.C. So uh, what's your take on this? Is, uh, yeah, the, conti- the question might also be, Doug, that's a good point, the Old Testament God, some people say, uh, is an angry God. Richard Dawkins says, I, I couldn't follow that God. That was one of my questions. He's an angry God. He's wrathful. And in the New Testament God, you talk about love. Um, there's a continuum between these. And, and, and how do you explain that? Yeah, it's, it's a, a very important point to, to bring out. Certainly, Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. Uh, Jesus was himself Jewish. Uh, Christianity emerges uh, from the religion of Judaism, from the pages of what the Jews call the Tanakh, what we call the Old Testament. And um, I think it's important to realize that Christians, of course, believe that um, God has revealed himself more specifically. There is a greater revelation in, in the New Testament, and as we think back to Yahweh, as we think about the God of the Old Testament, I mean, there are people who think, well, you know, God is, uh, you know, he goes through moods like human beings. Sometimes he's really angry, he's, he's, 
he's mean and angry, and then other times he's loving. But I think a better way of describing that phenomenon is that God is always loving. God is love. But there are times when love encounters evil, when love encounters rebellion, and wrath is simply love's response to that particular situation. Um, mm. God is God is a loving being. He didn't need to create people or angels in order to have fellowship. The Father loved the Son in the Holy Spirit for all eternity. And they, it, you, it, to use an analogy, God is like a family. He's, he's not the exact same thing as a mm-hmm. human family, but analogously to a family. And so... So God is not sometimes moody and uh, wrathful and then other times loving like I am. I go through moods. Most human <laughs> beings do. Yeah. But God is always loving. But, you know, when, uh, when, when you see evil, love, love's concern about people will come out in force. It will come mm. out in justice. So, you, so justice and love are deeply tied together. Absolutely. This is sort of a follow-up to the question about uh, Islam and Hinduism and Christianity. Usually when you have a second or third or fourth or fifth revision of something, you make it better, and people like it more. In this case, when I was talking about Christianity being the oldest religion, you have Islam and Hinduism, which came out afterward, and all these other religions that come out afterward, and... I still say that the oldest religion is the best, <laughs> yeah, right? right? It, it yeah. has the, the least uh, problems with it. Uh, but anyway, well, I think that's because of true. I think that's because it's true. That's yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. If not, you know, why? Why didn't they fix it? If there was something wrong with it, if it wasn't true, why didn't later revisions of a religion get better and better? Instead, it gets worse well, and worse. Yeah. What's interesting about that, when I was first in college studying religion, there were a lot of people theorizing that the original religions were polytheistic, and then monotheism was kind of a refinement. Mm -hmm. But what's very engaging and I think fascinating is that has been reversed. There is a movement within religious scholarship looking at ancient religion that now argues the reverse, that the original religion was monotheistic, mm. and polytheism was a corruption of that. Mm. Uh, my friend Lynn Corsion has, has written a book about original monotheism, and mm. so, you know, the, the idea that uh, God was one, and God was the Creator, and God had revealed Himself, and that later you have people uh, corrupting it, and I think that's that's certainly in line with what you're saying and with what we find uh, in the Bible. Absolutely. Um, I, think that's, I think that's a very good point that you made. I, I hadn't thought of it quite that way, but that, that's good. Um, before we get out of the questions about the seven truths, I want you to talk for just a minute about meaning. Because I, in my life, uh, before I was a Christian, I was an atheist and converted uh, later in life. And uh, Mm -hmm. so I was an atheistic physician and and got that way really because of medical school. Um, Most of my professors were atheistic and I just couldn't believe and I didn't have any apologetic tools at the time. So, but then I came to a point in my life where I I couldn't find meaning in just making money and in doing my work. And it led to uh, really sadness and, and depression and emptiness. And I think one of the important things about this, the Christian faith that is amazing is it brings hope and it brings an opportunity for meaning that I was never able to find uh, in, in the secular world. So could you talk a little bit about that, um, about the idea of meaning? Because I don't, I, my question is, can, a, can an atheist have meaning in their life? Yeah, this is... Uh... This is, I think, so critical because it's really at the heart of, you know, how we live our life as human beings. You know, just the other day I was watching, um, I was watching an HBO special about my favorite baseball player, Ted Williams. Hmm. And then later I, I watched a special about Mickey Mantle and then another one about Gary West. It was kind of my sports day. And I thought, here are three of my favorite athletes that I grew up admiring who have accomplished things that I wanted to accomplish when I was a kid, 
And yet, when you look closely at their life, uh, their lives are very tortured. Hmm. And I think, wow, you mean having all the money and fame and having as many women as you could possibly want, you mean that's not going to satisfy you? And I think that's the secret that people don't appreciate, that that money and, and fame and possessions, there's this painful question that comes at the end called, is this all there is? Mm-hmm. And I think you've asked a great question, uh, Andrew, about the issue of uh, can atheists find meaning. Some of my atheist friends, you know, I'll tell them, look, uh, uh, if atheism is true, that I'm going to die. It's going to be soon. Even if it's a couple decades away, it's still going to be soon. I'm going to have to die alone. I'll be dead forever. But the more I t- talk to the physicists, they say, well, you know, there's going to come a time when the solar system will come apart. Uh, in fact, if you allow enough time, there'll be a heat death. And the reality is that nothing anybody thinks or says or does is going to change that pessimistic scenario. Hmm. Uh, it's set in place. Uh, uh, you know, it's going to happen. And I then ask them, well, how do you find meaning and purpose and significance in a world that is, is ultimately going to end uh, with maximum entropy? Hmm. And often their response would be, well, I can create my own meaning, but I don't find that persuasive, because we have so little control of things. We don't get to pick our parents. We don't get to pick <laughs> our genetics. Yeah. We don't get to pick the, the political philosophy or the cultural philosophy we're exposed to. There are so many things that are givens in life that I don't think we have the kind of requisite mm-hmm. control. And so I think it is fair to say that atheism leads to an incredible meaninglessness, and a deep pessimism. And by the way, a Pew study I saw just this morning, it said that atheists tend to be very young people, uh, 35 and younger. Uh, They tend to be highly educated people. Uh, But, you know, when you get a little older and you think a little bit about life (laughs) and about your imminent death, uh, it could be that some of these people may begin asking questions, Mm because suffering... You know, C.S. Lewis, one of my my favorite thinkers, Lewis said that suffering is a severe mercy. It, it, it's severe, but it's merciful because it gets you to look up. And as Walter Martin, my first Bible teacher and my first uh, mentor, he said some people won't look up until they're flat on their back. Hmm. So no, I don't think the naturalist worldview can give people real substantive meaning the way Christianity can. Well, you talked about your uh, some famous baseball players like Mickey Mantle and, and such. You know, I'm a little bit younger, I guess, because I look at the Beatles. You know, you thought, well, the Beatles, they could have had any woman in the world that they or any women in the world they wanted to marry and all that, had all the money, had all the fame, and yet if you see who they were, you know, what, what went on, it's, uh, they weren't a bit happy. That's right. Uh, you know what? Uh, I'll tell you, Doug. I think that that's such a powerful point, and it and it's lost on a lot of us because I was a Beatles fan growing up as well. And <laughs> you know, you look at these people; they've got you know so much money and so much recognition, and so often they're very troubled people. They're they're not happy. Why? Mm. Because money and and fame and hedonism do not guarantee a deep sense of satisfaction and fulfillment. As my favorite Christian thinker outside the New Testament, St. Augustine, said, Lord, you've made us for yourself, and our, our hearts find no peace until they rest in you. And so we were made for God, and uh, having lots of fans and lots of groupies and lots of money, um, money is a good thing, and you can use your fame in a good way, but often these people that I idolized, very unhappy, very unfulfilled. That should be a lesson that human beings need spirituality. They, they need a deep sense of faith, and that's what can satisfy that, uh, that rustling heart that they have. Yeah, and I think, you know, moving out of the book questions, I just want to say that I think that's the capstone, meaning and hope. 
uh, that is yeah. one way that Christianity changed the world that nothing could. I mean, you know, giving us hope and and, and meaning in life. So I just wanted to say that I, I think that's an awesome part of the book. Yeah. Okay. Doug, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I have a, a question outside the book now. Our man, Dr. Ben Carson, is a seven-day Adventist. Do you see his faith as a Christian cult or as a separable denomination? I mean, what do you, how do you see the seven-day Adventists? I'll tell you a quick story. Um, the man I worked for and who taught me apologetics was Walter Martin. And in the 1950s, uh, the standard evangelical position was that the Adventists were, were a non-Christian sect or a non-Christian cult, like Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormonism or Christian science. Walter Martin, however, met with some of the leading Adventist thinkers, and he was one of the people that allowed the Adventists to be viewed as less than a cult. Um, hmm. I don't view the Adventist Church the way I view the Watchtower or, or the way I do the Latter-day Saints, and I'll tell you why. Uh, they affirm the doctrine of the Trinity. They affirm the incarnation of the person of Christ. Now, not every, even, not every Adventist is an evangelical in belief, but many of them are. Many of them are very grace-oriented. Now, they have particular beliefs about the Sabbath. They have particular beliefs about the state of the dead, annihilationism, and hell. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that all of their beliefs are kosher, but I think that uh, the reality is that when Adventism started, I think it was a cult. But Ellen White, who they claim as her pro their prophet, which is a, another problematic issue, mm -hmm. but Ellen White moved the Church toward a Trinitarian, a more Christian-oriented. Uh, James White, who was her husband, he was very much uh, an Aryan. He believed that Jesus was a creature. Mm. So I would say I think Adventism is Christian, but they have uh, very traditionalist Adventists who are somewhat cultic. You've got very liberal Adventists here in here in Southern California at Loma Linda. Many of these Adventists have gone to to very liberal. I mean, liberal theologically, not uh, politically. Mm -hmm. But you know, they believe in theistic evolution and many other issues. Mm -hmm. So it all depends on the kind of Adventist you encounter. I think. Okay, but they certainly don't fit the idea of a cult like we would Jehovah's Witness, it no. sounds like, and I think that's they, important. They do right? not. Yeah. They, that's right. They do not. Yeah. Or Christian, and, or what is that, Scientology? I, yeah, <laughs> right, yeah. Go ahead, Yeah. Ken. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, and I, that's where I think it is so very important to be able to, to, for people to ask the question, well, what is historic Christianity? What, yeah. what kinds of doctrinal beliefs I mean, when the witness knocks at my door, he does, he doesn't accept the Trinity. He he believes that Jesus was not divine; that the Father uh, Jehovah created Jesus. They believe that you're saved by witnessing to people and and by works. And so, I think it's very important to ask yourself, what is Christianity? What doctrinal beliefs are part of that? And how do these particular groups uh, fit into that context? Absolutely, and that's that brings me to the next question because um, I like to think of the historic Christian faith like a, a target or something. And in the center, you've got things that we must agree upon. You know that Jesus Christ is the yep. Son of God, and so forth. And as we move out on that target, we get into uh, areas out in the outer region that you know we may think somebody else may think differently, and these are in-house debates. Uh, we have to agree on the essentials, but that's why I have this question, and it fits in perfectly. We sometimes run up against the problem, especially in, in rural Kentucky and in, in, the, in the Bible Belt here, where uh, Christians within our fold though, will, will demand that the world is 6,000 years old. Oh and my yeah, you know, oh and, yeah. and if we're going to believe, you know, if Genesis is true, then we must uh, believe that the dating by, you know, a priest that said it was 6,000 years old. And I bring this up because it becomes a problem sometimes for us to know how to handle this when we're trying to look at uh, Christianity from an evidential or reasonable basis and, and be thinking Christians. And I just wonder, from your aspect, how do you deal with that? Sometimes as a pastor, this is hard for me 
dealing with people who have really dogmatic beliefs. Well, the same people say you, you must read out of the King James Bible. Well, exactly. That's well, the same kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. So I, I want to hear his take on okay. that. Yes, it's, uh, it's an important issue. I, I, I think what I try to do is, first of all, I recognize that a lot of our young Earth friends, they're very sincere. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they believe the Bible is the Word of God, and they have been taught or they have accepted the idea that you have to interpret the creation days in kind of a calendar day way. So there are six consecutive 24-hour periods, and if you look at the genealogies and you do a little mathematics, you get back to a universe that's six to 10,000 years old. I think what's important is maybe to bring up two points. One, I love the idea of the two books idea. Hmm. Uh, Augustine talked about the two books. Many Christians have. It's the idea that God has two books. One of them is a figurative book. It's it's not a book with pages and spine. It's the world. Hmm. It's the book of nature. And that book of nature reveals great truths about uh, science, uh, about uh, medicine, about philosophy, etc. And then there's the literal book of Scripture. And so both of these are books. Both of them are a repository of knowledge. Mm-hmm. And um, I think it's important to appreciate that the book of nature testifies very powerfully that we live in an ancient universe. Now, I also think it's important to help our non-Christian friends to realize that somebody like St. Augustine, and he lived long before the scientific revolution in the 17th century, Augustine didn't think of the days as six 24-hour periods. He said that these are not days like anything we understand. They, they, mm. they must be unique, divine days of creation. Wow. So here you have one of the leading Christian thinkers who looks at the days and says, I don't see them uh, as 24-hour periods. And he didn't say that because he was influenced by modern science. He looked at it exegetically. He looked at it from a literary point of view. So what I try to say is, look, could it be that there are some questions that need further study? Maybe maybe we have... uh, Maybe we've misunderstood the biblical text, and sometimes the book of nature can give us the indication that maybe we are reading Scripture mm-hmm. a little more literally or uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that's not terribly healthy. Boy, that's a great answer, and, yes. and it takes us to Augustine before we have to close out, because we're getting close to time to end the show. But, um, you know, we talked about St. Augustine was probably one of the most brilliant and prolific uh, theologians at the, of the Church Fathers. Uh, I became uh, acquainted with St. Augustine, and I know some people are saying, who is that? And this old monk, <laughs> see, this is... But the thing is, when I went through seminary, I'd never heard of him. I read Confessions, uh, which is the story of his life, essentially, his conversion. An amazing book. It's one of my favorite books. And I got so much from that, and then I went on to City of God and read his other works. He's a little hard to read because he writes, you know, in, in, in his day. But um, sure. but I'll tell you, I gained so much from reading him, and he's absolutely brilliant. And then he shows us right there that he didn't see the world as 6,000 years right. old, and he wasn't pressured by modernistic, dogmatic uh, belief system. So that's amazing. And then it brings me to ask you, you know, I know you think so much of Augustine as I do. For those who don't understand Augustine or why we would care so much about this old monk, uh, tell us why why you uh, are infatuated with him as well. Well, I think that I think that St. Augustine is arguably the most important Christian thinker outside the New Testament. So if we go outside of the, the influence of the apostolic authors like Paul, mm-hmm. then we encounter St. Augustine. And, you know, a lot of times people think, well, St. Augustine must have been a Roman Catholic, but, but Augustine has influenced both the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church. Mm-hmm. His ideas have echoed through time. I mean, Luther was an Augustinian monk. Mm-hmm. Uh, Calvin was uh, an Augustinian. Many of the early Protestants thought that they wanted to quote Augustine because they wanted to try to show the Catholics that the best theological tradition was on their side. Mm-hmm. So I think Augustine is by far the most sophisticated of the Church Fathers. I think he 
reveals so much about what's critically important about Christianity. He writes incessantly about grace, that we're mm-hmm. saved by grace, not by works. He writes about the Trinity. He, he writes about uh, various issues that re- relate to us as Christians. How do we relate to culture and society? So he wrote 25 million words. Hmm. Uh, again, I think he's arguably the most influential Christian thinker outside the New Testament. I, there are some areas where I, I don't agree with him, but I think that in the Western Christendom, there's nobody more uh, able to present Christianity and to defend it. And um, I think his book, Confessions, is it's just a wonderful book. It's it's not only a um, a Christian classic, but it's a literary classic. I mean, mm-hmm. if you take a degree in classics, you'll read St. Augustine's Confessions. And so I would encourage our, our friends, our brothers and sisters in Christ, if you've never read one of the great Christian classics, get a hold of uh, Augustine's Confessions, because there he talks about his life, and I think he's really talking about all of our lives. He's, hmm. He really had the insight that all of us have restless hearts, and yeah. all of us need that peace that comes from trusting in Jesus Christ. So I'm a big Augustinian fan. Uh, I'm an Augustinian in my theology, and um, I think Augustine, he gets most of the important things very right. I, I agree. He's, he, I'm uh, very much uh, Reformed in his manner as well, but I also agree— uh, uh, identify with him you said something that he tells all of our story and that's why i identified yeah. so well when i read his book doug i thought oh boy i gotta read this when i, I mean it was my first uh sem- it was actually the first class i took in seminary <laughs> 25 had, million wow. words you had to read 20- no i had to read confessions he was talking about his other books he's written okay yeah, yeah he did all that without a laptop right exactly <laughs> <laughs> he did all that without a laptop wow and, but i'll tell you why i identify with him so much he tells the story of him being restless and how he, I mean, he he came to Christ later in his life, and he tells about uh, his wild living. I mean, he re- lived very rebellious until he came to the Lord. I think that's why I, I resonated so much with Augustine, because he tells the story of a restless person who's trying to find meaning somewhere else and can't do it, and that, that was my life. So I'm like, wow, you know, I read this book thinking I would dread it and ended up absolutely loving it. So that's one of the things I wanted to talk to you about because a lot of people don't appreciate it, and it's really amazing. Um, we're getting close I to could, the I end. I couldn't Go agree ahead. more. Yeah. I, when I read the Confessions, I feel like he's talking about me, <laughs> me and that's, a, that's an exciting thing. Yeah. That's, that's a great author who can do that. Last question is, what is the biggest challenge you see in our church today as you look at um, the, church, the church with a big C? Um, in 2015 and moving forward, what do you see as some of the biggest challenges to the Christian faith and uh, talking to someone who's a pastor and trying to, uh, to mold that, uh, the fellowship of believers? Uh, what do you think? Yeah, I, I guess two things pop to my mind immediately. Um, there's a wonderful quote by the uh, Christian historian Yaroslav Pelikan, who taught at Yale. He said, the Church is always more than a school, but the Church can never be less than a school. Hmm. I feel a great concern that our churches are less than schools. We need to teach people um uh, we need a, a place where Christians can come and learn not only to think about the Bible and the truths of, of historic Christianity, but it also needs to be a place where they can learn to think about culture and society, uh, the challenges of same-sex marriage, the, the hmm. challenges that we live in the world that we do. So I think that that's a, that's a very big challenge. I'm a bit concerned that evangelical churches... Um, do not have a, a, a consistent dedication to training and teaching their people. I, I think the second element comes out, and, and that is I, I really do think that uh, along with good arguments, we need, a, we need lives that express love and commitment and uh, a deep sense of, of care for other people. 
you know, a brief story. I, when I was a, a young man, I thought, boy, if I'm going to do apologetics well, I really need to dedicate myself to it. So for most of my adult life, I would read three hours a day. I mean, there were quite a few days I didn't make that, but I, but most days I did. I read and read and I thought, I tried to read the most, what I thought were the most important authors and, and think and reason. But I came to a point in my life where I realized, you know, um, when I'd read 1 Corinthians 13 and I would think, wow, I can understand all mysteries, but if I, if I don't show charity, if I don't show love, if, if love is not a central characteristic of my life, then I failed. Mm. And I think for people who are cerebral, people who love ideas, people who like philosophy, like science, like engaging with ideas, mm. we also need to realize that we need to love our wives, we need to love our children, we need to be faithful fathers and faithful husbands. And so I think uh, those are the two elements that I would identify. The, the Church mm. needs to be a school. But it also needs to be a place where we point people in the direction, because I think the early pagans, I think the early non-Christians, they were deeply attracted to a religion that that had a deep sense of value and love and treated people as if they had dignity and value. Wow, that's a great answer. I couldn't agree more. And I think what you're saying there is, yes, know the truth, engage the truth, and teach it, but show it in your life so it's sanctification yeah. it's it's about uh, growing in the image of god and that, that's huge yeah. all right well we thank you so much for being here on the show ken and i just want you to be able to uh tell us tell people where they can find your books and where they can hear you on reasons to believe and then we'll we'll end the show yeah well thank you very much for having me if, if people want to find out more about reasons to believe and what the kind of ministry that we have there and the things that I'm involved with, you can go on to reasons.org. We have an extensive website there. Um, I do a podcast along with a, a couple of my colleagues at Reasons to Believe. We call it the Imago Dei, which is Latin for the image of God. So we try to look at controversial issues in light of that teaching that humans are made in the image of God. And there are lots of books there if you like philosophy and theology. And, of course, we have many books written by our scientists, Hugh Ross, Buzz Rana, Jeff Swearing. So the science-minded people, I think, will find a lot to like there, and I hope people who love theology and philosophy will, too. All right. All right. That sounds great. Yeah, I really appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much. We've really enjoyed it, and uh, I hope we can talk to you again sometime. Right. Thank you again for okay, coming on. Okay, well, God bless you guys. Thank you. You've been very generous and very kind. Thank you. God bless you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, so that was Kenneth Samples from Reasons to Believe, and and for me, that was a really a good interview. I hope you enjoyed it. Well, I could tell by your expression the whole the whole <laughs> <laughs> show that you really enjoyed this. He is a, a great thinker, and I've learned a lot from his books and from hearing him. So it was a real it was an honor for me to interview him. But um, but yeah, I think and I think he helped us make the case for apologetics and for Christianity being reasonable and being something that. Uh, you can you can prove within a reasonable range with abductive reasoning and uh, got in some questions about St. Augustine and overall it was a, it was a great show. All but right. So, this is God Talk where we rightly divide the line between science and faith. And this is God Talk where we faithfully examine science and reasonably examine faith. Please visit our website at godtalk.com. Our audio files can be found on iTunes, SoundCloud, and many other podcast platforms. You can find all of our God Talk videos by searching Dr. Andy and Doug on YouTube. Please visit our Facebook page at www.facebook.com slash Dr. Andy and Doug. Thank you for listening.